Good morning. So I, I'm Curtis Augusti. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon at uh, Benioff Children's Hospital. I, I serve both our Mission Bay and our um, Oakland campuses. And at Oakland, we are the level one trauma hospital for the Bay Area uh, for, for, peds, uh, for peds trauma. And um, it is my distinct uh, pleasure uh, to introduce my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Bethany Johnson Kerner, who is a pediatric neurologist. Um, she and I will be tag teaming uh, this, uh, this morning's event. Uh, Dr. Uh, Johnson Kerner is a uh, founder of our pediatric neuro recovery program. Um, and this is a program that complements expertise in traumatic brain injury across orthopedic, surgical, and, and rehab services. And it was started in 2021. And it supports patients that have a high burden of symptoms after mild to moderate uh, traumatic brain injury. And outside of her clinical care, her research centers around uh, brain injury aftercare, um, implementation projects for evidence-based cognitive therapeutics, uh, measuring quality of life after brain injury, understanding effective educational support for patients returning to school, and then um, researching um, how we, the providers, uh, our attitudes and practices um, uh, towards brain injury uh, are, are, are changing over time. So with that, um, uh, Bethany, take it away. Great. Thank you, Dr. Agassi. It's great to be here and great to see everybody. Um, so we'll be talking about mild traumatic brain injury today and spanning uh, concussion symptoms. And um, as you may have garnered, because you have a neurologist here, we'll be talking about non-operative management of mild traumatic brain injury. Um, so I wanted to begin this and we'll end the talk with this as well, that there are lots of options for follow-up. And one of the things we'll talk about in the cases, and I hope there are some questions about this, is which colleagues you can go to for follow-up, because it can be a little bit confusing at the outset to understand orthopedics versus neurology. And so I wanted to highlight this and we'll come back to this at the, at the end of the talks, but our, we have a fantastic orthopedic sports concussion program. Typically they're seeing patients in the acute phase of their injury. So typically zero to six weeks of injury. Often they'll follow patients up to three months post-injury. Exclusion criteria for them. So patients that are less appropriate for orthopedics would be an, if they have an abnormal scan, if they're seeing neurosurgery, for example, for a skull fracture or their age. So if they're younger than eight years old and they will see patients typically up to 25 years old. And important to know that the West Bay Clinic for orthopedics is typically focused on sports-related injury, sideline injury, or injury during practice. The East Bay Clinic, however, is uh, open to seeing uh, non-sports-related injuries such as motor curl vehicle con concussion that patients may have sustained. In pediatric neurology, we typically manage patients that have more persistent symptoms, so if they're lasting longer than six weeks. And then you have two options within neurology now. So we have general neurology. Um, and then as Dr. Augusti mentioned, we started the pediatric neuro recovery clinic because we were seeing a high burden of cognitive symptoms that were persisting for patients. And so we wanted to develop more multidisciplinary care around those patients. And that's a separate apex order, but all of these are options for colleagues that want to help you support these patients. So I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Auguste to begin with some of our interactive cases and polls. Yeah, so as uh, some of you have attended prior uh, events like this, uh, we we try to make this real world as possible and uh, case-based. And and we also, uh, Beth and I would, would love for this to be as interactive as possible, uh, the, as, as possible at seven o'clock in the morning as can be. Um, but we figured we'd start out with something that's nearly a, a daily dilemma for all of us. And I'm speaking to you not a, a, only as a, a, a physician and a surgeon, but as a parent. Um, people uh, know who you are. They know what you do. So if you go, if you're going to your kids' games and something happens, you are going to be the de facto traumatic brain injury expert. And so it would be nice if we can kind of equip you with just some basic comfort level and tools um, for, for dealing with these different scenarios. So this is going to be a daily thing that we deal with as parents. You know, your 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 seven year old is playing soccer, trips over another player, uh, falls and, and and hits her head on the grass. Didn't black out, no loss of consciousness, completely asymptomatic, bouncing around, wants to go back out, and the coach turns to you and says, um, "Is it okay for us to let her back on the field?" So what do you, what do you guys think? Just uh, give you a couple seconds and and click away. Okay. Well, um, as of right now, it looks like it's split across. And I, I wonder, I wonder what's uh, um, kind of fueling this. Um, th this is, you know, this is something that we have to you know, talk about. Um, we, I think we will approach these problems daily, both as uh, physicians that are going to be data driven. And uh, what is the, what are the, what does the literature say about risk factors of, of returning? Um, and, and then there's going to be the, the parent in us. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we can discuss it. Um, Beth, I don't know, did you answer yourself? 
I didn't answer panelists can't vote, but I, yeah, when, when that popped up and I wonder if this was related to the point that you and I had talked about yesterday, mm -hmm. we were talking about like a lot of this concussion care can be a little bit in the gray zone, especially for pediatrics. Um, and so I think I wonder for the people who are saying no, if they're thinking they want to do a formal concussion screen, or if they're thinking about delayed onset of concussion symptoms that can occur, but I'm curious what, what, yeah, what you're thinking. Greg. Yeah, I, I think there, I don't know that there's a wrong answer here, especially with a seven-year-old, um, and especially if it's like your first child. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I think having said that, uh, looking just at the clinical criteria, the, the, the mechanism of injury, the history, um, she it, she's seven. So uh, in terms of mechanism and, and height, she didn't fall from a very far distance. She's falling on a soft grass. Um, she's She immediately bounced up and is herself and is asymptomatic. Um, you can argue that she probably took a harder tumble and fall and head blow uh, in your living room um, and was up and moving around and jumping around and you didn't stop them from playing. Um, I think you'd be you'd be fine to take her out. You'd be fine to let her play. I think the risk is incredibly low for this clinical scenario of, of letting her back get back on the field. But um, in terms of evidence for why you might pull them out, I think I think the evidence would be limited uh, for taking her out of the out of the game. But it brings up this this dilemma of well, how do you know? Or what do you, what are you what are you using um, as your screening tools? And and so there are accepted and, and and widely distributed tools out there. And the ones that are currently most supported would be these two. Um, there's the sport concussion assessment tool, the SCAT. Um, this is like the sixth version of it now, and it's it's really designed for us medical providers. It's 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 a bit comprehensive. Um, and so with that in mind, for laypersons and coaches, there are other uh, screening tools available. And the most popular one and the one that uh, we would recommend would be the CRT-6. Um, we wouldn't want to go into great detail in a format like this, but I just want to give you a flavor for what these look like. Um, so you, you basically are effectively working down through a decision tree. Um, and the initial screen would be looking for really dangerous things, really bad red flags. And as you can see in the in the in the box in the corner, things that are serious like seizures and and severe headaches and um, deteriorating GCS. Um, and as uh, if the answer is yes to any of those things, you remove them from play and you immediately seek medical attention. But if the answer is no, you continue to work your way down through this algorithm. Um, and if you can switch to the next slide, Beth, you know, this, the rest of the scat is um, is just grouped into these categories. And then within each category. There are these uh, simple yes, no screening questions to help us uh, assist, assist you to decide, do we think that this patient um, has a concussion or is, 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 is heading in the wrong direction? Um, there's another um, uh, form of screening um, athletes that is, is sort of taking, getting more and more popular. And I experienced this myself with my, my son who just started high school, and it is to establish baseline testing. And so um, we're using technology now to um, work patients through algorithms where um, uh, a screening tool assists them on how to perform activities and they get a score and they get a baseline performance level. So now fast forward four months, seven months, eight months from now, and they, they, they slip on the basketball court. If there's a concern for concussion, the app turns back on again, and the, the, the same athlete performs the same battery of tests, and their, their current performance is compared against that baseline test. And if there's a significant deviation from that baseline, um, then there's, there would be a concern raised for concussion. So this is the way the field is working, and it's, I think it's totally appropriate to, um, to get, um, to get the, uh, technology involved. And Curtis, if I can, if I can just add for that. Um, so yeah, Sway is super interesting. It is prescription only, and it does seem like it can be prescribed through athletic programs. Um, and the cognitive companion to something like Sway would be impact testing, which many people have heard about, which is not necessarily tailored towards children, but is in wide use throughout the orthopedic um, play safe network through UCSF. So many of those participating hospitals in the play safe orthopedic concussion network through UCSF will do baseline impact testing to follow this as well as uh, the Sway testing. Right. So next next patient, things that go bump in the night. You have your nine-year-old who's playing Friday night basketball, went up for a rebound and, and bumped heads with another player. Didn't block out, actually finished the quarter and, and, and kept playing. Um, and then at halftime tells the coach, you know, I, coach, I feel a little dizzy. And right where that guy hit me, it hurts. Um, he's otherwise appropriate. He's intact. But again, the, the coach is turning to you because they know you work in a hospital. You're actually a doctor. Um, would you let him back on the court? Fire away. <laughs> all right. Well, I think uh, we are all uh, feeling the same way about this different scenario and may have led you down this road a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. All right. A little bit older now. Um, and not just the height of a nine-year-old, the height of a nine-year-old going up for a rebound. So now mechanisms very 
uh, very different than the first scenario. Not falling on soft grass anymore on a hard, hard basketball court. Um, and it's not as if he's feeling totally normal. He's, he's getting a little dizzy. And actually, the dizziness he complained of at halftime. You know, this is now a little bit of time has transpired since the event happened. And so, so could you argue that this is getting slightly progressive? Um, and then plus minus, it's not just dizziness, plus minus a little bit of a headache now, because, but you know, maybe it's just sore where you got hit. But you, you don't want to take a chance here. And so I think it, now you have a different situation. It's totally appropriate to take him out of, of, of the, uh, the game. But on to the next question here. Um, as, a, as a provider, um, are you worried enough that you might want to actually screen him some more and, and start looking for anything hiding? Okay, you guys are, you, you know, you're either split down the middle or you're like all in. Um, it's pretty interesting. So, and and I think, you know, Bethany, you, you brought up an excellent point. Um, you know, it, it, I guess we all have our, 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 our varying appetites for, you know, for risk and, and uh, risk averse and, and whatnot. I, I, you know, I think, you know, that begs the question, well, is there data in, um, to help guide us now? This is getting a little bit more involved. Um, and, and so there is. And so uh, the, uh, the PCARN, the, the Pediatric Emergency Care and Applied Research Network, is here to guide us and um, through uh, multiple um, uh, data-driven data um, analyses, they've developed this algorithm for us in patients uh, two years and older and, and, and younger than two years, um, again, working our way down a, a decision tree of, of symptoms. And if they meet any of these initial criteria, they're getting a CT scan, altered mental status, deteriorating GCS, um, and evidence of, of a significant um, skull fracture. If they don't have those things, it's a period of observation, um, looking for things like loss of consciousness, um, and uh, again, uh, very, very severe um, symptoms or, or, or mechanisms. If the answer is no to those things, um, there's not a, a requirement for a CT, and actually they wouldn't recommend it. And it's important to mention this because sometimes you actually have to um, explain to a family why you, you are not recommending a CAT scan. I think some, some families are actually insistent on it. Um, and I always have to take a little bit of a, of a, of a double take when I look at the PCARN uh, uh, recommendations, especially for the, for the babies, uh, younger than two. So if I'm a parent and my baby blacks out for four seconds, um, I'm going to be concerned. And so you're telling me, doctor, that you wouldn't recommend a CT scan. Well, again, the data doesn't support that. And usually the way that we try to reassure them is to say we are genuinely concerned about radiation exposure in kids. And that, that was one of the main driving forces behind PCARN's evaluation of whether to scan or not, is that we are, we are basically delivering you know, unnecessary doses of radiation to, um, to, to vulnerable populations here. So, um, so this, is, this is where PCARN has helped. Yeah, and just to add to that, there's a negative predictive value of 99.95%, so very good in the, from that category. And there is an MD calc, um, so it's like easy to use. Even some instances of APEX have this built in, so it should be pretty easy to use. Um, moving on as far as acuity goes, this is a patient I saw, a 17-year-old who went off a large ski jump. He landed on the tips of his skis and fell onto his head. He had loss of consciousness for about one minute, and experienced seizure-like activity witnessed by bystanders for about four minutes after the accident, described by EMS as tonic-clonic. EMS on arrival to the screen, he was ANO times three, he had a GCS of 15. He is amnestic to the event, but otherwise totally intact. He only has right thumb pain, facial pain, and a swollen lip. He got a head CT in a hospital up uh, near a ski resort, which was negative. And uh, neurology was called over the phone. He completed one week of CAPRA for that. And at five week follow-up, he's experiencing fatigue and headaches. And at five month follow-up, he has ongoing fatigue and difficulties with focus. So our next question is for this patient. So he's had a negative head CT. Our question for him is at five month follow-up, would you get an MRI scan? I feel like I'm leading the witness here. Okay, interesting. So it looks like 78% said yes, 22% said no. Um, and I know that with MRI, there are a lot of issues as far as access, logistics, things like that. But one of the points I wanted to show you his imaging and show you, so this was his head CT on day of injury, as I mentioned, um, negative head CT and skull windows or bone windows were normal as well. His follow-up six weeks later, 
um, has some subtle evidence of diffuse axonal injury. So SWI sequence as a reminder, being most sensitive for picking those out. And so um, I didn't put multiple screenshots here, but you can see um, some of these small spots here and there. And we can think, um, we'll talk about why this matters for the family, but there is some evidence basically comparing head CT and MRI scan. Um, it's tricky, especially in kids. And for you know, three papers that show that head CT underestimates brain injury. There are also three papers that can show that, you know, MRI doesn't add much in these cases. So I think it's correct to have some variability in what providers are doing right now. We're in a little bit of a gray area. But in some studies, um, CT, head CT can underestimate injury. And so in, in as much as 10% of patients, you're more likely to pick injury up on an MRI compared to a head CT if there's loss of consciousness, if they have persistent symptoms, or if there's a, a linear skull fracture. It's also more common if they have multiple injuries compared to one injury. And in particular, like in this case, uh, the MRI is more sensitive for de detecting diffuse axonal injury, which can be hard to detect uh, on a head CT. And you may think, okay, well, that MRI was pretty unimpressive. Like, why am I going through the trouble and utilizing healthcare resources? But it is important, I think, especially for these families with persistent symptoms for two main reasons. One is that there can be sort of upstaging for prognostic purposes for family as far as how long will these symptoms persist. But then also logistically, there's more access to resources. So schools will often come back to us and say, We've never seen a patient with a concussion having five months of symptoms. What's going on? And you can say like, well, there's actually evidence of injury on the scan um, and then access to additional supports either in the community, the medical setting or in the school setting. So it is it can be really helpful when I counsel families, though, about getting an MRI scan. I'll say, you know, there aren't best practice guidelines to guide on if we need this and when to get it. About, as you know better than most specialties, about 15% of cases, there will be incidental findings, which can send families down a rabbit hole of, you know, needing follow-up scans, which can be really frustrating. Um, and then as those who have participated in more sophisticated research, like in the TRAC TBI study, Clinical MRI scans likely underestimates white matter changes. So we know that research grade scans can detect um, diffusivity changes um, in our white matter that a clinical MRI scan does not. So an MRI, a clinical MRI scan does not necessarily mean that there was no parenchymal injury, but it's sort of our best level of care that we can provide to people currently. So Bethany, I'll ask you a, um, a practice question. Do you get a lot of families, in two different questions, um, a lot of families who had an initial MRI that had DEI, the question is, doctor, do we have to, should we, shouldn't we get another MRI down the road just to kind of see how that DEI is going? That's the first rule of patient. The next is, um, I hear at UCSF, you guys have these amazing, even more powerful MRIs. Um, shouldn't we be looking deeper and getting one of those as well? And how do you, how have you been, have you had many of those and, and how have you been managing those? Yeah, great question. I'd say more often than not, families with any kind of TBI, if there's any sort of initial finding, expect a follow-up scan. And that's one of the things we try to do outreach to for our pediatricians and our ICU teams is generally educating folks that we expect scarring down of the tissue and encephalomalacia in those areas and not necessarily expansion or progression. I will absolutely recommend a follow-up scan if there's new changes. You know, for example, headache red flag features, positional headache, blurry vision, new tinnitus, things like that, things that aren't making sense with our findings on the original scan, but usually we don't do the follow-up uh, scan. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as more advanced imaging, yes, and I'm starting to see, you know, especially if you get uh, the scan done on the right day with the right neuroradiologist reading it, they'll comment something on sometimes on, you know, DTI and things like that. But as a general practice, that's not yet in our clinical care. I'm hoping that as the pediatric track, track TBI gets up and running again and there are more opportunities we can engage with studies, um, but right now clinically, um, we're not doing more advanced imaging. Great, okay. and I'm spot on, same same for both for me. And I, I just I, I just figured for our attendees, you, you out in the community may be getting similar questions. Why aren't they Why aren't they getting another scan or why are they getting you know research protocol kind of scan just so we all have consistent messaging? Yeah, perfect. Um, and then I wanted to point out a little bit about impact seizures um, because there's a lot of confusion around these. And just to share our perspective as neurologists, that um, they're pretty low incidence. They occur about 1% of concussions. There's really variable practices as far as what people do, which I think adds to some confusion because there's not great evidence for this. I think in the adult world, the general practice is not to start a medication, but in the pediatric world, we tend to be a little bit more cautious. Families are worried. Some people will start Kepa for a week, some until they're seen in clinic. 
Um, and then importantly, the mechanism of this is thought to be more autonomic. Um, so essentially like a child with a breath holding spell that has seizure-like activity or convulsive syncope, it's not thought to be electrical changes in the brain, sort of spreading depolarization leading to a GTC. It's thought to be more autonomic. So that's one of the main reasons why it's not um, incorrect not to start an anti-seizure medication. And this, there's no evidence that these impact seizures are associated with post-traumatic epilepsy, which is a whole different entity. Typically, that's for patients with parenchymal injury, um, and that occur, can occur in about 15% of patients. But post-traumatic epilepsy, as you may know, can develop any time after injury, so even 10 years post-injury, which is why we have these patients you know, on prophylactic keppra for a week and then uh, discharged off of that, typically. So I wanted to switch back to another common scenario that people may have experienced in their own personal lives or in the clinic. This is a 14 year old with a mild TBI one month prior. They were struck with a basketball in the head, no loss of consciousness, preserved GCS. Um, they were counseled by their local clinic to stay home from school, to avoid screens, avoid physical activity until symptoms resolved, and they were referred to neurology. And when they come into neurology clinic four weeks later, they're having headaches, dizziness, and fatigue. So we wanted to poll our audience again. What do you advise them? Do you have them continue to rest until their symptoms resolve? Do you have them do light aerobic exercise? Or do you say no activity restrictions, you're four weeks out since your injury? Okay, so the most popular choice is light aerobic exercise. And then we have about a third of people selecting continuing to rest and the uh, minority is no activity restrictions. Um, and so this is a really interesting point. So uh, B is the correct answer. Um, and this is uh, fairly recent data. So the so essentially concussion experts get together every five years or so prior to 2022. It was the Berlin consensus. Now it's the Amsterdam consensus. Um, and so it turns out that sort of indefinite cocooning in a dark room is associated with prolonged recovery. So now um, there's a shift away from cocooning towards active recovery. And so this is the uh, sort of, I borrowed this from Carlin Center, one of our amazing colleagues in the sports concussion program. So generally what you wanna have people do is rest for no more than 48 hours and then start to do the sort of graduated activity that you can see with each step taking about 24 hours. Um, if you have access to it, um, and if there are ongoing symptoms, patients can get what's called a BCTT, so the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test, to help guide subthreshold aerobic activity. In practice, because in neurology, we don't have access to uh, Buffalo tests right now, um, nor to physical therapists that are dedicated to this, like they do in orthopedics. So what we usually have patients do is basically follow their symptoms. And if they're having more of a two-point increase in their symptoms, or if they're feeling uncomfortable, basically to go back to the prior level and stay at that level for another uh, 24 hours. But um, starting to do light aerobic activities um, early on is uh, a fantastic way to improve outcomes. Yeah, so Bethany, this was the poll I was most interested in seeing. Yeah, uh, how our how our audience feels because um, when you have a kind of a paradigm shift like this, it takes time. There's a lag, you know, as as it trickles into our into our practices here at UCSF and to our community. Um, I remember starting my practice as a junior attending, and um, there was a tremendous amount of literature supporting. You know, you cannot really move the needle on an activity exercise until symptoms have resolved, and so. Yeah. Now we have to obviously undo all of that, but that's why we have meetings like this. This is why we have our grand rounds and supporting uh, our, our community providers so that we can, in an effort to um, to have consistent messages. Yeah. Um, and so like in this case, the family comes to you and says like, okay, we'll do our graduate exercise, but you know, what about going back to basketball? What's the risk of concussion now that our child has had one concussion? So your options are no increased risk, twofold, threefold or fivefold increased risk. So just curious what people think. Okay, so the most popular choice was a twofold increase followed by a threefold and then least popular were no increased risk and fivefold, but some distribution in all categories. Um, here, the correct answer is a threefold greater risk with some caveats. So I've read a lot of concussion incidents and prevalence studies. They're very hard to do. A lot of them are based on self-report or bias samples, but 
This is a very large study um, done in 2021, 23,000 children. Um, and it was found that uh, the, the risk of concussion was three times greater than those without a history of concussion. Um, and there is some evidence of, that athletes with a history of concussion may have a slower recovery from subsequent concussions compared to the first one. I think like Curtis has been saying, families just wanna know, especially what sports to do and um, what's risky, what's not. And so there is some data on uh, concussion rates by various activities and gender. So here you can see concussion per 1000 exposures by sport um, with football um, not having a gender associated with typically that's uh, a gendered sport with uh, males playing, but B is for boy here and G is for girls here. And so I won't go into the details, but it's just helpful to know that there is some data out there. So when families ask, you know, what is my risk of judo for girls? <laughs> it's, it's quite high, but it's worth looking at a couple of studies if people have particular questions, just because I have seen quite, quite varied rates of what's published out there. But with sort of football leading the pack um, as usual for children, just like we've been hearing about for professional athletes. One thing I did want to point out is this... Um, Nature study from 2023, which was essentially looking at sort of what, the, what are the G forces that professional athletes, professional football players, American football players are experiencing in a typical season, and putting this in context for families who may be very anxious about, you know, going back to basketball or soccer after one or two concussions for their children. And it helps me at least think about sort of how to put all the information we're hearing in the news about chronic traumatic encephalopathy for children with the big caveat that we don't know for children. We don't know for a high school athlete who sustains four concussions over the course of four years, does that increase their risk of dementia and CTE in the long run? We just don't know. But this was essentially, the study was looking at measuring G-forces that players are experiencing without necessarily concussion, but just what are the rotational experience, forces that their heads are experiencing. And as you can see, you know, this is on the order of 10,000 per season. To compare that for a concussion that you or I would sustain, say, playing a sport or in a motor vehicle, is more on the order of 60 to 80 G. So I think those are just helpful things to keep in context when we're thinking about you know, what's in the news versus what are the practical risks for people, because we don't necessarily want somebody to retire from sport after one concussion if they've made a good recovery. I think that might be a little bit extreme. Uh, so the next case is for those patients that are just really struggling. And <laughs> Curtis changed some of these titles for me, so I'm getting a little Easter egg this morning. The gift that keeps on giving. So this is a 17-year-old uh, with a history of mild TBI. She had a concussion nine months prior. She was swimming, had no loss of consciousness at the time. And she has ongoing dizziness. Um, neurology, we love dizziness. So she has both episodic vertigo and disequilibrium. She wants to know if she can return from swimming. She's nine months out. She has a totally normal neuro exam and she's had a normal MRI scan of the brain. And I didn't wanna to go too much into the details of this, but just to give you a sense of how neurologists think about dizziness, it's essentially the duration, basically. That gives us a clue as far as what's going on here. And the things I wanted to call out um, that people may be less familiar with, but are important causes of dizziness, in these patients, so POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome, very common to have dysautonomia after concussions. That's one thing that she was tested for. The other thing she was tested for um, is superior canal dehiscence. So patients who have onset of dizziness with hearing a loud sound can ex actually be experiencing an inner ear cause of dizziness. So that would be a reason for them to see ENT or a, a neurootologist. And then ultimately in this case, this patient was diagnosed with a relatively new diagnosis, which is called PPPD or triple PD, you may hear it sometimes referred to, which is persistent postural perceptual dizziness. And this is a subtype of a functional neurologic disorder, FND being about 15% of the cases we see in a general neurology clinic. And this is really important because it's important to name it for patients, diagnose it early if possible. And sort of the key features for this one are variable symptoms and then just a sense of disequilibrium equilibrium in visually chaotic environments. So that was ultimately her diagnosis. Um, so she was uh, ultimately cleared to go back to swimming with a lot of focus on desensitization around symptoms. So basically, when we are when we experience new symptoms, neurologically especially, we can become more cognitively focused on them, which can actually act to amplify our symptoms. So a lot of the work we do with athletes is doing sort of gradual exposure, just like you would do for a phobia, um, working towards getting back to your um, sport with the um, sort of 
being okay with some of that discomfort and being reassured that it's safe, that it's not dangerous to go back to those activities. And I think that this is really important to realize. We often think like concussion should go away within two weeks. Why does my kid still have headaches after that? But actually 20 to 30% of kids will still have symptoms at four weeks. Um, and these are the vast majority of patients that we see in the neurology clinic is patients with symptoms at four weeks, four months, four years. And that's a lot of what we uh, see. Some of that may be pre-morbid conditions. So we know that um, a concussion can unmask pre-morbid conditions that were present, but we still sort of treat them in the same way as far as a symptom-based approach. But just an update in terminology, PPCS, is it's no longer post-concussion syndrome because there are very vocal symptoms that may be present. And we know that there are many things that contribute, including a family or personal history of headaches, family or personal history of mood uh, disorders, uh, ADHD and learning disabilities. And these can all be things that tip people into having symptoms that last for longer. So Bethany, um... yeah. First of all, apologies for the titles. I just couldn't resist. Um, okay. Second, um, do you find yourself, because here we are, we talked about this paradigm shift of, okay, we got to nudge them a little bit, you know, get them moving. But now we have some patients who are with lingering symptoms. And I think there will be a subset of our parents who just, it's it's making them incredibly nervous now. Um, and, and they will have this, this potential um, temptation to cocoon again. Do you find yourself in the, in the neuro recovery um, program having to kind of nudge them still and, and, and coax them and, and support them and cheerlead them a bit? Yes, 100%. Absolutely. Um, and there's us, you're, they're sort of foreshadowing a slide I have later, which is the parental response and that parent child dynamic does absolutely impact um, outcomes for traumatic brain injury in a way that does not for things like orthopedic injury. So a lot of the work we do is yeah around supporting parents and having them feel more comfortable. Like why you know we do dig into some of the research. Like what are the G forces that you or I sustain with a concussion versus a football player? Because we are this is the era of concussion recognition, which is fantastic, but we have to also put put that data into context. Um, so I wanted to call this out. Um, just thinking about new medical comorbidities that can occur after concussion that people may be less aware of. Because I think historically, like Curtis has said, a lot of you know concussion care was about expected management cocooning, like reassure, reassure, you'll get better, you'll get better. But in some cases, it is actually important to look for new things that may occur, occur medically in patients. And this is where your consultants and pediatricians can be helpful. But obstructive sleep apnea, especially if your patient has a history of that, really you know large increase in that in concussion, I mentioned POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. So presenting with um, tachycardia and dizziness uh, that tends to be positional can lead to fatigue, headache, things like that. There's a large overlap between concussion and PTSD symptoms, and there's no specific treatment for PTSD and concussion. It's essentially mental health therapy. We generally don't advise people to find a TBI specific counselor. That's a bit of a unicorn that may be hard to find, but just getting connected with a mental health provider, whether it's for the family who may be traumatized by the event as much as the child is. Endocrine disorders can occur more typically when there's something on the scan. I'd say it's pretty rare in concussion. It's not my general practice to screen, but if somebody is having, um, like in the case I showed you with minor diffuse axonal injury, uh, we will do endocrine screening to make sure that there isn't, for example, a cortisol deficiency leading to uh, chronic persistent fatigue. Insomnia is one of the most common things we see after concussion. Also very common, I didn't, I couldn't find good numbers to support how common it is, probably because it's hard to study as far as um, incidence and prevalence, but ocular motor deficiency. So if you remember from the neuroanatomy that our eyes are essentially on very fine little yoke and pulley systems. And so it's very common for people to experience optic, uh, I would say cranial nerve subtle changes after a blow to the head. Um, so experiencing convergence and divergence insufficiency, which may be missed on a routine vision screen, but great to go to an optometrist uh, who has some experience in this, like the Berkeley um, binocular vision program uh, and others in the Bay Area. Uh, the horse whisperer case. Uh, so uh, our next case is a 17-year-old with a left occipital skull fracture and trace subarachnoid hemorrhage with, from a helmeted fall from a horse. There was no loss of consciousness, preserved GCS. 
she initially had a loss of taste, um, which is fairly common after this kind of injury. At six month follow-up, her taste recovered, which about 25% of patients experience a full recovery. She has some minor headaches, back to school five weeks without any issues, and she would like to return to horseback riding. And to emphasize our sort of point from earlier about the, the utility of MRI, so this was her head CT on the day of injury, um, and this is a screenshot from her MRI brain scan two days after injury, and she uh, unfortunately experienced uh, bifrontal contusions that were present here. So we do have another audience poll question. What would you counsel this patient for returning to horseback riding? Um, no contraindications if she has no symptoms, first, first choice or retirement from sport. She's doing pretty well. So yeah, 71% said no contraindications if she has symptoms, um, and uh, the other quarter said retirement from sport. This is a really tough one, um, and one where I hope that within our, our careers, there will be more evidence for pediatrics. Um, but right now, the data we go off of is from a Green Journal paper from 2018, so the Green Journal being the... Um, AAN, American Academy of Neurology, is sort of our gold standard in our profession journal, and would actually recommend officially retirement from sport. Um, I just took an excerpt from their algorithm. So structural, al structural imaging findings, yes versus no. And so absolute contraindications would be the presence of diffuse axonal injury, frontal temporal gliosis, which would be present in this case, or if there's other structural significant injury conferring risk of bleed. Um, so this is really hard because you could think back to the ski jump case that we had where, yes, there was diffuse axonal injury present, but quite minimal. Um, but there's like no sort of expert level of guidance as far as, you know, mild versus more moderate levels of structural injury. I think, though, what I've observed in practice is, like the audience poll reflects, a bit of a wider variety in outcomes. And I think uh, what providers recommend, and I think being practical in, you know, just making sure that we tell families, you know, what are the risks, and we document that. And then if people understand that, um, you know, it can be okay. Ultimately, in this case, um, I felt like it was um, reasonable for her to consider to go back to riding, given that her and her family understood the risks associated with that, given she has done so well. Um, one of the things I did do a little bit of a dive in for her was thinking about horseback riding. We do get a lot of niche questions about various sports, and it was interesting to read that horseback riding is a relatively dangerous activity uh, for athletes. Low quality of evidence, a lot of this kind of survey sidelines at 4-H events, um, but they do have a higher rate of hospitalization for head injuries in some studies greater than motorcycle accidents and car crashes. Part of that is likely because they are at baseline, you know, nine feet above the ground. Um, and part of that may be a little bit of bias as far as um, asking riders who are at professional riding events. But in this particular case, as in a lot of cases I've had, you know, when we go through the pros and the cons, you know, truthfully, at the end of the day, sports are a big motivator for many of our young people. So it's a very difficult dilemma. It's a it's a tough situation to be in. Um, but I think just going through the risks and the benefits and talking that through with families is is the right thing to do. Um, so I did want to just re-emphasize the supports that are available, again, moving away from cocooning and expectant management to active support. So we have physical therapy to guide aerobic activity, vestibular therapy, headache treatments. Um, a lot of us in the field have very finely tuned 504 uh, and IEP letters for families to help them maximize the services that they're able to get as well as one of the things that we'll do is addressing pre-morbid ADHD, learning disabilities and anxiety disorders that have been present um, in our patients. And I just am particularly um, proud of one of the things we're able to do in our neuro recovery clinic, which is to do outcomes tracking. This I'm hoping will lay the foundation for a future program evaluation to understand and to really check to make sure that the services that we offer are actually improving outcomes for our families. So our patients do do a, a pediatric quality of life survey, and it's really been really interesting to see that parents tend to rate quality of life lower than children, um, and that mild, moderate, and severe families with TBI all report actually quite similar um, quality of life after TBI, which is interesting and not something you'd necessarily expect, but I think speaks to how much even a mild TBI can impact quality of life for a family. It just puts them on a different, different course. 
and other things on the horizon. I'll pass it over to Curtis. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be remiss uh, being a member of the Department of Research at UCSF to um, have a talk on TBI and, and not uh, mention how lucky we are to be uh, uh, colleagues with the group at the county and uh, Dr. Manley and his, his team. And it is the quintessential multi-institutional effort to really understand a disease um, and uh, put forward recommendations and guidelines. I mean, I, I don't think it's actually a pipe dream that um, in our in our lifetime, there would be not, not just outpatient, but potentially even mm -hmm. subacute or acute settings where we would be able to look for serum markers for TBI in kids to help us work through some of these really diagnostic uh, dilemmas. So. Yeah. And uh, just to add to that, I, I do know, as I understand it, that serum markers are being used at the ZSFG, but have not yet been implemented into the um, pediatric workflow. So more to come. Stay tuned for that. Okay. Um, and so just to end where we began, um, you have lots of colleagues who are excited to help you guys um, care for these patients. Uh, orthopedics dealing more with acute injury um, and their locations are at Mission Bay, Oakland, Walnut Creek. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I had their phone number up there, but it disappeared. I can put that back up. Um, but that's just a referral to orthopedics. Um, and then pediatric neurology, our phone number is here for the Pediatric Brain Center. Um, and we have locations all throughout the Bay Area and are happy to partner with you. And just got a message that uh, the track TBI team is in the house. They Excellent. are probably here this morning. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining. So I think with that, uh, with uh, the time remaining, um, let's open it up. Uh, we would love to field any and all questions. Um, I'm sure some some dilemmas come up in your in your workplaces, and we would love to help help work through those. Okay, here we go. Best return to play um, school resources. Mm, yeah. I think a lot about um, the CFL. Um, so Concussion Federation League um, has a, that's in the Bay Area, they're in Marin. They have a really nice uh, return to play. Um, the other thing that can be really helpful is asking if the school that your patient or child operates in has a athletic trainer program because that can be a fantastic resource. Um, or if not, like I was mentioning, getting connected with a physical therapist, usually through the Department of Orthopedics to do a uh, return to play stepwise activity. Um, but I have a dot phrase, um, you're welcome to borrow it, uh, which is basically a concussion return to play. And like I mentioned, it goes through that. And then if people are in other locations and want to get fancier, there is a home adapted version of the Buffalo concussion treadmill test that people can do like with an Apple Watch uh, heart monitor. So that is an option as well. It, are there any keywords we should monitor when we triage outpatient calls? That's a good question. I think like in um, Curtis had brought up the, um, the SCAT and the CRT. <laughs> I don't, I'm not aware of a resource for nurses as far as thinking about, um, you know, key things to listen for, but I think it goes back to those key symptoms, you know, do they have symptoms right now? What was the mechanism of injury? Um, I think those are both great things to, to think about. Um, yeah, I don't know, Curtis, if you have other thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I, I guess for, for, for calls, outpatient calls out, you know, emails, I think it just puts us in a tough spot because we are at the mercy of what what information details they're able to give us. And so I don't think I never think it's the wrong thing to cast a wide net and be a little bit over over anxious or con, uh, conservative when it comes to that stuff. And and unless it's like, I just want to run this by you. You know, Johnny had a symptom like la like two weeks ago and he had it for like 20 minutes today. I just want to make sure it's OK. Unless it's one of these very mild, incredibly mild intermittent things, um, I don't think it's ever wrong to simply say, you know what, I think I'd feel a lot better if we had a chance to sit down by by Zoom or telehealth or, or come on in just so I can take a much more thorough history. What we, we wouldn't want to do is is potentially make sure we're, miss, we're not missing somebody because we didn't ask the right questions or the, or the, the parents didn't clue in on the right the right details that they didn't tell you, you know. Um, and we just, again, just countless times where we've caught something, some critical detail in the history that just, um, you know, they didn't think to mention, you know, that, that they slept for 17 hours, you know, seven days in a row, you know, um, things like that. Um, so um, I, I, I would never fault you for just, um, just maybe being a little bit cautious and bringing them in or telehealthing. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, guys. Well, I guess we'll we'll, we'll probably call it. It's it. Uh, have a great rest of the day. And Bethany, thank you uh, so Thanks much for, um, for for being my my partner in crime. And um, and you know, looking forward to the next. Awesome. Okay. Take care. Bye. Take care, guys. Bye. -bye.